On to our next presenter, who is Dr. David Gerber. Dr. Gerber uh, grew up in Toledo, Ohio. He started working, uh, he got a history degree and worked as, as a juvenile uh, protection officer before beginning his career in medicine. He's now a medical oncologist uh, specializing in lung cancer at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And he's going to talk to us about the genetic mediators of immune related adverse events. So Dr. Gerber, welcome. Susan, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present my work this afternoon. Are you guys able to see the full view and hear me at this point? Yes, thank you. It all miracle good. of miracles, great. So, <laughs> We're all learning. Um, it, it really is an honor to uh, have received funding from the V Foundation. Uh, I've been at this work for uh, close to 13 years and getting that notification recently was really a career highlight for me. So by way of background, I, I think for this audience, unless you have been living under a rock for the past decade, you've heard something about immune therapy. Uh, these drugs go by various names, but most commonly immune checkpoint inhibitors, and they truly are field changing for medical oncologists. One of the greatest revolutions we've seen in the last 50 years. They can be effective in so many different clinical situations and now are probably already FDA approved for at least a dozen different types of cancer. Um, but the elephant in the room and something that is often overlooked in the enthusiasm of these agents is their potential toxicity. And I think that's particularly concerning when we think about survivors and thrivers and what it might mean to have a potentially severe or permanent event as a result of this exposure. So immune-related adverse events, which I'll be abbreviating as IRAE in some slides, autoimmune toxicities, and unlike chemotherapy toxicities, these adverse events are entirely unpredictable. They may affect almost any organ. In some instances, they may be life-threatening. So my group and I hypothesize whether or not someone develops one of these toxicities really has to do with characteristics of the patient's immune system and their own genetic predisposition rather than the biology of the tumor being treated. And so our project aims to determine these characteristics, ultimately allowing us to predict these toxicities so we can customize this treatment and monitoring for our patients. The toxicities of chemotherapy are usually easy to diagnose and are actually like Mr. Hamilton, I'm going to say something new that I say to all of my patients after they You have greater expertise in than I do because I've prescribed it to hundreds of patients with lung cancer. I've never received it. When we give chemotherapy and lung cancer, most often we're giving an IV once every tell patients before they start that if you're going to have nausea and vomiting with our regimens, it's most likely in the first week. When your blood counts are at their lowest during the second week is when you might feel the most fatigued. And for most of our patients, they start to lose their hair after the second dose. Immune-related adverse events are entirely unpredictable. Who's going to get it? when it's going to happen, and how severe it's going to be. So this is an example of pneumonitis, or life-threatening inflammation in the lung. This is a CT scan or a CAT scan, and you just have to imagine that it's a slice through the patient's chest. He's lying on his back here, and his friend here. This is his spine. These are the blood vessels coming out of his heart. And normally, each of these lungs would just be essentially black, showing air, as you can see outside the body. All of this whitish gray filling in is abnormal. And that's what led to the patient needing to go to the ICU. This is a patient who, after a few doses of immune therapy, 
developed a severe clotting disorder where the blood shut off to his fingertips, many of which he lost due to this side effect while being treated for melanoma. These adverse events are incredibly diverse compared to those of chemotherapy. They may affect almost any organ system in the body. I'll already give you an example of the lungs or pneumonitis. There's also the eyes, the thyroid gland, pancreas, leading to GI problems, the joints, the muscles, the intestines, the liver, the skin, even parts of the brain. How do we manage these circumstances when they happen? Well, there is no dose reduction the way there is with chemotherapy or targeted agents because it's not the drug itself that's causing the side effect. It's the patient's own immune system that is hyperreacting when these drugs stimulate it with the hopes of an immune attack on the cancer. But these events happen when that immune attack also spreads to normal tissue and organs. What's thought to be a clinical risk factor for this happening if someone already has autoimmune disease? They already have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. It's felt that their immune system is already hyperactive, and so that's going to predispose them to have even more problems when you give immune therapy. And because of this, patients with autoimmune disease have been almost universally excluded from every single clinical trial of cancer immune therapy. So we asked what we thought at the time was a pretty straightforward percentage of patients with cancer have autoimmune disease as well, so might not be eligible for these highly promising therapies. Well, as you might imagine, some of the autoimmune disease ones that we saw, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, lupus, ulcerative colitis, for example, but the actual prevalence of these diseases vary tremendously depending on how we looked in a national database called SEER, or Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results. If to identify a case of autoimmune disease, we only required one instance of a physician putting in a diagnostic code in the patient's chart, it wound up being 25% of patients. Mm -hmm. But if we were a little more conservative and we said there had to be at least two instances of the diagnostic code, it fell to 14%. And that was a reminder to me, that was a wake-up call, that it's actually pretty hard to diagnose autoimmune disease. In some ways, we have it easy as oncologists. A cancer diagnosis is usually based on pathology and a biopsy. It's a yes or no answer. But to diagnose someone with lupus is multiple clinical criteria, findings on a physical examination, some blood tests, some imaging studies, and there can be a lot of disagreement between physicians about which patients actually do and do not have some of these disorders. So thinking along those lines, it occurred to me that immune-related adverse events are autoimmune diseases we're causing with our treatments. I wonder if they're also difficult to diagnose. So in this study, I asked two other physicians who are highly experienced with immune therapy to review 50 patient charts. And for each, all those patients, for each one I asked them, did the patient develop an immune-related adverse event? If so, what type was it? How severe was it and when did it happen? And so on the left here, what you see is the two different clinicians, one in red and one in blue. And you know, in some side effects, for example, on the lungs, there was a difference in the rate that was observed. So the physician here on the left thought it occurred a little bit more often than the one on the right. But for effects on the adrenal gland, which is an organ next to the kidney that has some hormonal functions in the body, they both agreed. They both said 8% of the patients developed this side effect. Well, then I actually looked at which 8% of the patients they were, and they weren't exactly the same patients, as you can see here. Only some of them were the same patients. And in other cases, one physician 
thought some patients had adrenal insufficiency, but the other didn't. This made me realize a couple of things. If I'm gonna study the ability to predict immune-related adverse events, I better be really confident in who's actually getting them. So for our work, we now have at least two different physicians reviewing the clinical history of all the patients, and any disagreements are resolved in a group discussion. The other thing that it made me realize was that when I set out to do this work, my goal was to be able to predict who's gonna get immune-related adverse events. Now I realize that some of our findings may even help us diagnose those toxicities. So what have we done? We have developed a study in which we approach and enroll patients and to start cancer immune therapy. If they agree to enroll, we start collecting their clinical data, we draw blood before they start immune therapy, and then periodically afterward. We're trying to look at the genetics of these patients. We're looking at their immune profiles and also the molecular underpinnings of their immune system. And so far, we've actually been able to enroll over 300 patients. This platform has allowed us to study clinical events and biological changes over time. This is one set of blood we looked at in the blood draw before patients started their immune therapy. And we saw differences in these blood tests between those patients who didn't go on to get autoimmune toxicity and those who did. This is a really interesting case of a woman who developed an autoimmune side effect on her blood vessels, causing her fingers to get very white and painful in some circumstances. She actually didn't get this side effect until she'd been on treatment for more than 20 months. And we thought to ourselves, what is happening that she's cruising along just fine? We don't change the dose, we don't change the schedule, and all of a sudden this problem hits. When we look at substances in her blood called autoantibodies, or part of her immune system that might be attacking normal organs and tissues, it looks just fine up until a month before her side effect, and then everything goes haywire. In conclusion, while cancer immune therapy, these drugs that we call immune checkpoint inhibitors, represents a highly promising treatment, may also cause toxicities that are permanent. And to study the prediction and characterization of these events, these are some of the large cohort of patients serial blood samples for We have identified some biomarkers associated with the development of these toxicities. With V Foundation funding, we're now working to find the underlying genetic characteristics that may explain why some people develop these toxicities and some don't. And I really hope that this information may help us customize the administration and the monitoring of immune therapy so we can make this treatment even more available and helpful for our patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Gerber. That is, it's so interesting and so important for us to recognize what those pre-existing, you know, immune compromising diseases might be doing to uh, the treatment with these wonderful, but as you said, sometimes with some pretty severe side effects, uh, immunology agents. So thank you very much for that presentation.